the nonprofit MBA purpose is to provide new business insights and fresh creative ideas for executive directors and their teams that will help them improve their organization. Here is your host, Stephen Halasnik. Welcome, everyone. My name is Stephen Halasnik, and as usual, I'll be your host for today's nonprofit MBA podcast. I am the co-founder of Financing Solutions, and for the last 12 years, we have been the leading provider of lines of credit for small nonprofits in the United States. And unlike most companies who say, I'm the leader and the leader, we are. You know, if you Google nonprofit line of credit, we're going to come up first. So, uh, you know, we've been doing it for a long time. We specialize in in nonprofits uh, and it's it's about 80 percent of our clients. Uh, And so, uh, you know, having a line of credit is just great for a nonprofit. It just allows you to manage your cash flow better. And you're not unique if you think that your cash flow goes up and down. Uh, It happens to every nonprofit we talk to. So if you're interested in learning more, uh, please visit our website at nonprofitmbapodcast.com. And we have a sponsor for today, as we usually do, a Raise. It's A-R-A-I-Z-E. They are, it is online accounting software that's specifically made for small to medium-sized nonprofits. You know, it's, it's just so much better to use an industry standard uh, accounting package that is made for nonprofits than using something like QuickBooks or something that wasn't made for a nonprofit. Try to make it work. Uh, and, uh, you know, Joe over there has been, you know, he's been an accountant for 40 years. He, the, the software that he, uh, has made, uh, for, uh, a lot of nonprofits that, that use arrays, uh, is, is really great. I know we switched to it, the nonprofit I'm a, I'm a board member on. So if you're interested in learning more, go to arrays.com. It's A-R-A-I-Z-E.com, or you can call Joe at 866 866- Eight four zero seven four four nine. Uh, today, I'm very excited to be speaking again uh, to Steve King, uh, Stephen King from Growth Forth, uh, and we're going to be talking about why your nonprofit needs a sustainer program. We'll get into details on that. Uh, but before we get started, Steve is a high, highly energetic and motivational business leader, entrepreneur, and speaker. Steve has a passion for helping businesses and nonprofits reach their growth potential. Regarded as a top accounting industry thought leader and founder of the first company to deliver accounting over the internet, he now serves as the founder and CEO of Growth Force. Steve has spent several years working for Amnesty International USA at a very high level, managing the organization's 300% growth. So he knows nonprofits really, really well, knows accounting really, really, really well. And I didn't read his whole bio, uh, but you know he has a ton of experience. So, Stephen, welcome to today's nonprofit MBA podcast. Stephen, thanks for having me back. Yeah. So, uh, before we get into it, I mean, I didn't say it much in the, in, in the intro, but what does Growth Force do? Growth Force is an outsourced accounting department for nonprofits. What we do is we provide everything from the basic bookkeeping all the way to the CFO services. Uh, on an a la carte basis. So you can pick and choose what you want to keep in-house depending on the skills you've got. Most of our clients have got a really strong office manager who also has the title of finance manager, but they're not a CPA. They don't have a degree in accounting. They're just loyal. They're, they're, they, they understand the organization. They understand the basics of QuickBooks. And we come in as the controller and the CFO and provide them with support and make sure the board reports are meaningful. They're strategic. Make sure that you're audit ready 12 every single month. And we most importantly, we teach our clients, the executive directors, the program managers, and the, and the finance people, how to read and interpret the results, how to be able to look inside the accounting system and see how much money is left in the budget. Can we afford to hire this person? And when we're going to ask for more money, which is my passion, how much does it cost to run this program per person served, including the allocation of the overhead and the executive director salary? I get it. I get it. I think it's just smart. I, I have I had an outsourced CFO at one time, and you know he was great. Helped me help me get a, a bank line of credit, actually. So. Uh, you know, this was just uh, 10, 15, uh, 15 years ago when I had another company. So, uh, so today's topic, why your nonprofit needs a sustainer program 
imp- and you know it, the, the tagline really is to improve donor retention by eighty percent in the first year. So let me ask you a question: When did you start seeing sustainer programs starting to be the trend? Like that whole concept, and before you know, we'll get to what a sustainer program is. But when you first started hearing about sustainer programs, you know, was it ten years ago, five years ago? When did it start really becoming a big deal? First time I worked on it was in 1993. Gotcha. I, when I was when I was the CFO for Amnesty International, it was you mentioned 300 percent growth. That was because of Bruce Springsteen and you two and Sting on a Human Rights Now tour at MTV. We had, we grew from six million to 18 million dollars. But all that growth came from direct mail. It came from, you know, literally millions of people signed up after watching MTV and said, okay, I'm going to give you $25. I'm going to be a member. And then we would go back and, you know, using Craver Matthew Smith as our consultants who were outstanding, um, we would go back to them and, and ask them for more money and we would sustain relationships with them and we would cultivate relationships and we would acknowledge their gifts and show them stewardship reports and do all the traditional things that you would expect. But um, after doing, after being the CFO for four years, I got an opportunity to become the director of development. Now, instead of just spending the money and budgeting for it, I had to raise it 20 million a year. And so I realized one of the first things we had to do was an income diversification program. 94% 94% of our, at that time, it was about 16 million came from direct mail. And every time the cost of a postage stamp went up a quarter, it killed us because we had so much direct mail going out. And so when I moved from the finance to the fundraising, I went in through, I looked at with our consultants, what are all the different avenues that we can implement to help diversify? So we did personal solicitation of major donors, which is the number one ra- way to raise more money. That's a whole nother podcast. We did uh, foundation grants. We had already been doing and dabbling a little bit. Planned giving was a big investment that we made, but sustainer program was something that I hadn't heard of before. And, and it was brand new. And we, 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 we were looking for, recurring monthly revenue, right? MRR, monthly recurring revenue. Because in every organization, it's seasonal. You know, 70% of the money comes in from Thanksgiving till the second or third week of January. And you have some events in the spring, you know, you'll have a, a golf outing or a, or a art, art, uh, I saw my clients, just one of my clients just had a talent show that was a fundraiser, a dance-a-thons, whatever you do in the spring. And then you have a gala in the winter or the fall. But those dog days of August, they kill you. And so what we've developed is a program built, built on that experience from Amnesty 30 years ago of how do you convert select donors to monthly giving donors, to to monthly recurring revenue donors or sustainer program donors. And, you know, just to answer your question, I've been, I've been working with clients on doing this ever since. Now, you know, so it's so contradictory, isn't it? Because like I can think about 1993, I'm in your position and someone says to me, um, uh, I'm a donor and uh, I'll tell you what, I'll give you two options. I'll give you uh, uh, $1,400 now, or I'll give you $120 a month for 12 months. I would have been, give me the $1,400 now. You know, I, I, you know, so, you know, what, what was the, was it is was it a hypothesis? The idea that if you break the, the the amount of money down to a smaller amount, that it would not, it people would not cancel. So there's a there's there's a couple of critical things in there, Stephen, that you you touched on, which are a really great question. And 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 today's donors want this even more. First thing is the timing of when you do this. This is not something that you do now when we're recording this, you know, September, October, because you don't want to mess up the year end giving. This is a perfect campaign to kick into gear 
in February, February 1st, right after your, your last of your year-end donors come in. And, you know, most of those checks, let's acknowledge it, right? They all come in in January because people write the checks uh, on December 31st or on January 5th and they backdate it. So once you, all those year-end gifts come in, now what you want to do is you want to segment your disc. It starts with data, right? Growth Force is all about making data-driven decisions. And what you want to be able to do is look at which are the donors that you want to personally solicit. Take them off the list. Your top mega donors, right? We're, we're going to ask them for, you know, big gifts. Those are not the ideal clients here. We're also going to look at... Uh, we're going to look at the clients that are really small one-time gifts. We're not going to focus on them, right? What we're looking for is the people who consistently give you a modest amount. And what, you're, what you want to do is get them to give you more each month than you would get once a year. So how do you do that? If you take, let's say we'll use round numbers. So somebody gives you $1,000 every year religiously. This is the, the idea of a sustainer program is you don't want to just take that $1,000 and now spread it out over the, over the 12 months, which is not a bad thing anyway, because you're going to have higher retention with donors that you're cultivating more frequently. And I'll come back to that. What you want to do is you increase the amount that you get by 20% by taking that same amount that they give you. I give you $1,000 a year, drop off the last zero, so now you have 100, and ask for them to give you $100 a month. Now you've gotten $1,200, 20% more. And more importantly, you have an opportunity every month, some nonprofits do it every other month, to build a relationship with that donor that didn't exist when they just sent you a mailing. Every month, what you first, so first off, when you create the program, you want to create something that's special. It's an invitation to join. It's exclusive. You're a special part of us. At Amnesty International, we called it Partners of Conscience. This is our special group that's going to get special mailings that is going to sustain us, which is why they call it a sustainer program. It's going to sustain us throughout the dog days of summer. Our, the biggest expense in every nonprofit is labor. It's the biggest expense by far. It's over 80% of the cost of your expenses. When you factor in health insurance and 401k and recruiting and training is the people. And so ex explaining to people that you want to have a monthly giving program that you can sustain the lifeblood of these, these organisms, of these people, of the, of the people that you're paying for, makes sense, except that donors don't want to pay for salaries. They don't want to pay for overhead. But what they will pay for is the outcomes that further your mission the most. And the Society of Fundraising Executives says that if you can show the donor the tangible result of their gift, you're going to get more frequent giving. You're going to get higher average gifts. And so you're combining those two concepts together with this. We have to show the donor why their contribution makes a difference. And with a sustainer program, we get to do it every month. Here's an email that says, Thank you for your gift of $100. I wish you could have been with me at the top of the stairs on the first day of school when your contribution allowed us to be able to hand out backpacks to, to you know, our new starting class. And you show a picture of this kid opening up the backpack with a big smiling face. That's just, that, that cultivation mailing can, builds a connection now with the donor that you didn't have an opportunity to for well, somebody who just mailed a check-in. Are there people who don't believe in um, the sustainer program and it's why? Gener it's generational. I mean, I, well, first off, if you have a really good director of development, they understand that for a certain segment of the donor base, this is gold, right? 
we're, we're, the worst thing that happened is that thousand dollar donor says, no, I'm good. and still giving you a thousand dollars. At least you've gotten some engagement, but the better. Why, why would somebody say that? Why would someone say I'm better? I'd rather give you a thousand dollars now. Why would somebody do that? Because you might, you're, 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 you might not know what your year in bonus, your year in giving is until you know what, whether or not your giant corporate corporate overlords are going to give you a big bonus this year. Yeah. 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 But what happens is, and the, and the, and the, the statistics are really interesting here. The, the, the younger generation is more interested in keeping it easy. You know what, what they're interested in is setting up something and forget it, set it and forget it. And they want to feel good. So if you're going to send me an email every, every month or every other month with a, with a photo of, you know, the clients that you served or the villagers that you served or whatever you call your, your beneficiaries and you make it easy for them, they would much rather that than you send me something at the end of the year. And then, you know, God forbid, I have to write a check. Can I Venmo you? Can I Zell you? Make it easy for me. And you make it easy for your accounting department because all of this can be automated. One of the things, though, that I suggest is that you don't use credit cards. Debit the bank account because the credit cards change. And what happens is, this is a rookie mistake, you have to now pay somebody, go chase somebody with three emails and four phone calls, and nobody wants to return that call. Oh, yeah, that's right. I'm giving you guys how much? $100 a month? All right. Yeah, I got to do that. Well, it doesn't happen for three months. And then finally, you'll get them. That labor cost goes away if you just ACH the, 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 um, the that bank account, which is easy to do with most banks. Yeah, so I, I'm just thinking of my own situation. I have two organizations right now that I give uh, monthly to. And, you know, like most busy people, I, I get so much email. And there's no way I'm going to read anything from the two organizations that I give money to. I just don't have the time, right? Uh, and if they mailed me something... Uh, you know, I, so I originally gave money to these organizations three years ago and I just continued to, to just do the sustainer. And what happens is too, I mean, I'm just showing you the insight as to a busy professional. Yeah. You know, I get, you know, I'm on, I have Apple TV. I have, you know, Roku. my cable, my cable bill. I have, uh, yeah, I still use cable. Uh, uh, you know, I have, uh, you know, tons. And, yeah. I have tons and tons and tons of reoccurring and, you know, I don't even pay attention to all the reoccurring, uh, charges because they're, you know, they're not really that significant to me. Right. Um, I, I believe, I believed in these two organizations to begin with. Um, you know, I'm not hurting for money. Uh, and I, there's a certain percentage of money that I want to give away. So I just let it go on autopilot. Um, I, I, I'm, there's no, I'm not, this isn't a leading, uh, I'm just telling you the insight of the way I think. Right. Now, if they came to me and they said, uh, we would, we want, uh, a $10,000 donation, uh, instead of, you know, what the reoccurring that I do, I'd say no. Right. You know, but the reoccurring thing is it's on autopilot. I really don't even think about it. So, you know, I think it, it lends itself well to that. Um, I guess you could have the director of fundraising uh, uh, come back at me once maybe they ran uh, – you know, did some investigative work to see what my net worth is, you know, you know, and say, okay, these sustainers uh, could afford a lot more money. Let's, let's call them up and see if they'll make a one-time donation of a much larger amount and then take me out to lunch and tell me all the good things you're doing. Yeah. You that, know, that's step one, right? The data you have to yeah. say, you have to get a good CRM and segment your data so that you can see who are the donors that are 
the most likely to give you a major gift. And, you know, major gift means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. It's surprisingly small. You know, even at Amnesty International, a major donor back in the 90s was $5,000. And we were a $16 million organization. So if you are segmenting your list and you see people who are giving you $1,000 and you can easily run some, some you know, uh, there's very inexpensive database matching software to go in there and say, okay, you know, if you're in zip code 77345, you're more likely to be able to write a five-figure check than anybody else. Take them off the list. We're not talking about the major donors. What we're talking about is the ones that you're not cultivating, the ones that you don't have this, you don't have the time to go after somebody who gave you $500. So now, but if you can go back to them and say, hey, give us, drop the last zero, give us $50 a month. Now, all of a sudden, you have a, a, an opportunity to create a relationship, to invite them to your events, to, to you know, whatever donor cultivation activities you're going to do. Now they're feeling a little bit closer to you. And, and to your point about nobody has the time to read the emails, it doesn't matter if you read them. What matters is as you're scrolling through, I got one this morning, right? Wheelchairs for Warriors is one of our clients. They provide custom fit, complex uh, wheelchairs and mobility solutions to injured veterans and first responders. They, they, they understood that to have a monthly giving program, you have to brand it. You have to sell it. You have to call it something, right? Partners of Conscience, Founder Circle. I just worked with a dance company. They were rebranding as a new organization. And in their case, they called it the Touch 22 because donors can give $22 a month because every single day, 22 veterans take their lives. And, and, and by showing the donor the tangible result of their gift, if you give us $22 a month, what that allows us to be able to do is to, to pay for the, the cost of X and achieve Y, show them what the ROI is on that little amount. Because you've given us $22 a month, we now have the ability to count on funding from all of the people in the Touch 22 program to make sure that we have the, the cash flow to sustain this meaningful work to stop this daunting statistic of suicide in, in, in vets. You know, we have, we have uh, a thousand people giving us $22, that gives us $22,000 a year. And that's how we're able to maintain our crack staff to be able to build these custom fit contact rehab mobility wheelchairs. And what that does is it's not what you're paying for. It's not the salaries. It's the outcomes of the person's work. And because we're able to create these custom fit wheelchairs that allow them to live the life that they had before they went, uh, they got injured. Like for example, one was an archer, competitive archer. That wheelchair allows them to be able to have a professional bow and compete. Another guy was a hunter. The wheelchair has treads that allow them to go up into a deer blind in North Texas and go do hunting. What that does is it reduces suicide. So always the story has to come back to your mission and what are the outcomes that further the mission and how you, Stephen, with your $22 gift, have helped us save a life. Let me ask you a question. So let's say you, you look at the data and you see that, you know, 10% of the people give you one-time gifts every year. Would you go back to those people? So, so let's say one of them gives you $500 a year. Would you go back to that person and try to convince them? to give you $40 a month instead of the $500 a year? $50. Drop the zero. Yeah, well, whatever. You know, I'm, no, I'm just no, saying, yeah, an important. equal. No, that's important. I want to get 20% more. Oh, I get what you're saying. Okay, okay. okay. I'm not looking for the same amount. I'm looking for 20%. So let me, but, but is there, so let's say it's, if you took 500 divided by 12, 
you know, whatever that is. That's why I used $40. Let's say $45, 40. $43, right? Whatever it is. Yeah. So if it was equal amount, if it would you prefer the sustainable program and why? Yes, because cash flow is king. Well, well it's all let me, let, me, let me say it a different way. It depends. If you don't have a cash flow problem and you have the, the fully funding that you need, it ain't broke, don't fix it. Yeah. But if you have seasonality in your fundraising, if you have those times where you have to dip into the line of credit in July and August, or if you, th- you know that there is more money to be gotten from your donors, if you could just connect with them, this is a cultivation opportunity every month, every other month. And that's the most valuable thing a development team can do is, you know, donors come from concentric circles, right? The people who are benefiting directly from your mission are your best donors. The people whose family benefit from your mission are next. The people who know people who are touched by them or in their community. And so the closer you can bring the donors' emotions to your mission, the more likely you're going to get a larger gift. Yeah, I, uh, you know, I've done a couple podcasts and sustain, uh, sustainability programs, and the the only thing that, uh, and I know we're just cutting hairs here, but the the one thing I think I heard was that there's a higher probability of drop off for somebody who makes a one time year donation than there is for somebody who gives a smaller amount every single, not a small amount, same amount, but over a, uh, a monthly basis. So the argument would be, it's better to convert that person to a monthly program and instead of a one-time donation, because they'll be with you longer. But I certainly would imagine it's, you know, you're, everybody's busy at a nonprofit, right? And, you know, you're, 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 you're like, you know, really is, you know, is it better for me to have a program to convince people who are one times donors to, to give monthly, you know, there's probably a better use of your time than to do, do that. Uh, is that fair to say? No, I disagree. Oh, you, you, you would. Oh, good. Okay. I, I, I think it's a very good use of your time to convince these middle of the road annual givers to monthly giving. Yep. And the reason why the statistics show that you increase your client retention, your donor retention, is because you've built a connection. Why, why do people at the end of the year decide, you know what? I used to give $1,000 to the Houston Food Bank. I'm not going to do that anymore. I'm going to give it instead to the Montgomery Food Bank because it's close. Yeah, it happens all the time, yeah. All the time, right? And the Houston Food Bank happens to send me so much direct mail and junk mail that I – would stop giving to them just because they're wasting my much. cash. But the, the decision to move to another donor just gets made flippantly. There's a lot of money on the sidelines that's looking to be donated, and people don't feel good about any one organization to say, I want to get behind them. They don't have the time to invest to understand whether or not your money's being well spent, whether or not the outcomes that you deliver matter to me. They don't have guide star accounts to be able to look up the details. And so by having that monthly touch, all of a sudden, the reason why you you would leave at the end of the year is there's no emotional connection. This is sales, right? People buy from emotions. And that's why when you write that monthly giving program, there's a couple of great tricks here. First off, you want to write it in the first person. I wish you could have been with me. Bring them into the room in your eyes as the executive director, right? To show them what you see. Now, all of a sudden, and even I just got one this morning while I was waiting to get on here. And I got 157 emails since I signed off last night, right? And so I was just flying through and I saw one and I just saw a picture of some villagers at the village center. And it just was like, made me feel good. And then I hit delete and I moved on. But I have that dopamine charge for that instant that makes me feel good that look at look at what I did. I'm a good guy. I'm I'm making the world a better place. And that's why this matters. You can't do that with a once a year gift donor. And what the Society of Fundraising Executives says, if you show the donor the tangible result of their gift, when you can now go back to them in October and November and say, 
Thank you for your $100 a, a month. We have a special year-end program. We're about to start a new vocational program or whatever it is you're doing that's new. Would you consider investing in this program? And the worst thing they can say is, no, I'm good. And the best thing they can say is, tell me more. And now you can find those gems of the monthly givers that we're giving you 500 to 1,000 who can give you 15,000 or 50,000. And so that you're building connections with a whole class of people that you wouldn't ordinarily touch. And you're solving your cash flow problems in July. What's the, what's the form that you get at the end of the year that shows your donation that for tax reasons? What's, what's that form? You get your, is, it you get, is it a 1099? You get, you're going to get a receipt, actually. You're going to get a, a donor receipt from the organization. There's no tax form. There's no thing. So, so let me tell you what I just uh, brainstormed on. I have never gotten a donor receipt with uh, uh, a details as to, you know, where my, you know, what my money went to or, you know, you know, any type of feel. And you know what the thing is? Everybody looks at that 1099. When you get it, when you open. I'm wrong. I'm wrong. It's not a 1099. It's just a, a letter from the North. A receipt. For the receipt, right? So, so that's an opportunity for people to, to, here's your receipt. And by the way, this is what, where it went, right? I, I don't think I, I don't ever remember getting, uh, I always get the receipt, but I don't get, so like, get, you know, you know, the key ingredient for keeping your clients who are sustainable members uh, or, or everybody is getting that message to them, uh, you know, about, you know, that feel good moment, that dopamine that you talk about. And you just said, you know, the emails, you had 157 emails overnight, you know, that's common, you know? So uh, it's a, it's, it's a, it's a different uh, idea, but, you know, along with, you know, the, the net about is along with the strategy of your getting donation strategy, you know, you need to have a communication strategy as well. And you have to make sure it's not too much and that it's, well, the quality is good. Uh, you know, I mean, I'm not raising an issue that everybody doesn't know, right? But still, I listen. <laughs> I gave, I give, I was the largest fundraiser. Uh, tw I, I raised twelve thousand dollars for for this organization that I believed in last year. Uh, largest fundraising uh, that out of anybody that did it, right? And I gave us uh, uh, outside of that, I gave six thousand dollars, right? And this is well, and this is well known in all the nonprofit uh, circles that how bad this is. But my thank you was horrible, horrible. My it was horrible, and and I I'm not going to do it this year, right? Like I believed in it then. Uh, I don't really believe in the and this is a eight. Oh, what are they? They're a six million dollar organization. You know, they should know better. Yeah, you know? and you know, never, and we're coming up around October when the uh, uh, wait, I, what was the fundraising? I forget when the fundraising started uh, last year. So you know, I'm just not going to do it again. And you know, and nor have I gotten a call from them saying, "Hey, Mr. Holasnik, are you going to?" you know, help us fundraise again this year, or are you going to make a donation again this year? You know, and, it, and you know what they, they, they put all their effort is that first, it was the first gala I ever went to. It was huge. It was so successful, highly organized. And the auctioneer was amazing. <laughs> I mean, that guy could have gotten money from a stone, you know, um, you know, and I guess they look at that gala and say, well, that's, that's all we need to do. Yeah. It's a mistake. I'll tell you straight. Oh, of course. It's a mistake. Of course. And here's why. Galas are outstanding, outstanding events to have. The primary purpose of the gala should be to acknowledge and thank your, your best donors and your best volunteers. And it should be a, a way to recruit new donors and new volunteers. 
and the the you know there's there the fundraising aspect of it is powerful i'm not suggesting you don't go and ask for money and you have a you know but you have to measure the cost of that silent auction where you sent your you only have two staff you know on on two people on staff you got to prioritize those limited resources and and running them around town to find free bottles of wine for a you know a silent auction is not a good use of time if you have donors that you could be cultivating and meeting with and asking them for larger gifts and then have them make that gift at year end as part of the the gala but the gala isn't the end of the relationship like it is with you you got a letter that says hey thanks very much here's your receipt you know you, you have to decide what the tax cut deals are because it's you know we don't we don't do that it's dry antiseptic letter instead what your gala should be a part of a uh, the, re- the relationship continuum cultivating in the gala. We're going to acknowledge you for this big gift that you ge- gave us or pledged to us at the end of the year. That's what the top, top fundraising organizations do. And you have to have a strategy, a communication strategy, as you say, Stephen, on not only the acknowledgement, and I love, I'm going to write, I wrote it down here. That's a blog idea. I'm going to write down, I'm going to do a blog on using the a thank you letter for a stewardship, right? To show the donor the tangible result of the gift. And you have to have what they can call cultivation mailings, where you're not asking for anything. That's what stewardship, sorry, that's what sustainer mailings are. They're just a series of cultivating mailings. Those are the ones that help you grow someone's giving. When you tell first person stories, when you bring them into the emotions of the organization. So it's not just the acknowledgement letter that's critical, but what also didn't happen is somebody to come back to you 90 days later and say, because of your $12,000, actually your $18,000 contribution, when you combine it with your personal gift, here's what the, we did. Here's what the outcomes were that helped us further our mission. And we would not have been able to do it without you, a member of our partner circle. Yeah, I, uh, you know, it's good stuff. Um, you know, I think that at the end of the day is you need to have a sustainable, we got to wrap this up, but, uh, you know, at the end of the day, you need to have a sustainability uh, plan. So, uh, you know, I'd like to thank so very much Stephen King from Growth Force for coming on today's podcast. And if you like today's podcast, please f- feel free to share it with a friend. The Nonprofit MBA podcast is now in the top 1% of all podcasts in the nonprofit space. And I'd like to thank you all for that. Uh, we have a lot, thousands and thousands of, of listeners and it's, you know, our guests are fantastic like Stephen King. And uh, such as the name Nonprofit MBA stands for, there our guests are fantastic. So uh, if you have a friend, please pass along the idea about the Nonprofit MBA podcast or just send, shoot them an email saying, uh, hey, this is a really good thing for you to listen to. Uh, also, if you really like today's podcast or any of the other one, please give us a five star review. It's the number one way that uh, our podcast gets uh, uh, put in front of other people. And of course, if you're looking for a line of credit for your nonprofit, you can visit our website at nonprofitmbapodcast.com. Stephen, if anyone wants to get in touch with you, how would they go about doing that? Well, if somebody is struggling with financial management or they're not getting actionable reports for their program managers or their board to say at a strategic level, go to our website, growthforce.com, G-R-O-W-T-H, force, slash, NFP, not for profit. We have a form that allows you to just start a conversation with someone in our team to get a lot of great advice because we've got a nonprofit reporting ebook, the executive director's guide to board reports and manage reports, a lot of podcasts. Or just email me, Stephen, S T E P H E N, at growthforce.com. I'm also on LinkedIn and Twitter, Stephen King CPA. Great. Thanks for coming on. Thanks for having me, Stephen. So I, I just want to uh, uh, thank all our listeners, of course, but I just want to remind everybody, as I always do at every podcast, uh, uh, that uh, you are no good to your cause. You are no good to your family. 
you are uh, no good to yourself if you don't think of yourself first when it comes to taking good care of yourself. Uh, you know, people who run nonprofits are extremely compassionate people and they think of everybody else first. And I want to remind you that you're, that you can't do that and, and be successful at your mission, your mission. And what you're trying to do is a marathon and not a sprint. And we all know that if you sprint a thousand or a hundred yards, uh, your energy is all gone. But if you, you know, take it slow and you, you know, keep taking good care of yourself, great athletes train. So don't forget to, you know, take care of yourself, eat right, exercise, sleep, take care of your family. Those are all things that are going to help you win this marathon, which is helping people. And again, I just want to thank you all for doing what you do. This world uh, needs your help. I know that Stephen and I are both trying to do our own part in our own way, but you guys are out there every day, and I thank you for that. So other than that, I want to thank you all for listening to the Nonprofit MBA podcast. It was a great podcast. Steve did a great job, and we'll be talking to you soon. Have a great day.